let's look at the pleural and the pleural cavity. The pleural membrane is a thin, slippery, and glittery serous membrane that protects the lungs and the internal wall of the thoracic cavity. When you open through the thorax and you see the lungs, you see that it appears to be shiny. It is because of the pleural membrane that tends to overlie it and also lining the interior walls of the thoracic cavity. So this pleural membrane is made up of two layers. We have the visceral layer, from the name visceral, it means the pleural membrane of the organs, that's the visceral itself. And the viscera in question here is the lungs. So the visceral pleural is the pleural that overlies the lungs and this is highlighted in blue. You can see that this is the lungs and you see the pleural lining over the surface of the lungs. This is the visceral pleural. And the second layer is the parietal pleural. They are highlighted in red lining the interiors of the thoracic cavity. And this is the parietal pleural. We have two major types. We have the visceral that lines over the surface of the lungs, and we have the parietal that lines the interior surface of the thoracic cavity. So let's go for that to learn more about each of the pleural membrane. Before then, let's look at the function. What is the function of this pleural membrane? What do they do to the lungs? Well, one of it is that they help to protect the lungs because it's like a protective covering so as to prevent structure from directly coming in contact with the lungs. So it acts like a protective guide to the lungs. Also, it helps to cushion the lungs because it acts like an extra pad to it. The surfaces are not just wide open, but they are covered or lined over by the pleural membrane. And this helps to add like a more cushion effect to it so as to prevent it from wading up during contact with other structures, during movements. So let's look at the visceral pleural. We've said that the visceral pleural is a layer of the pleural that directly lines onto the surface of the lungs. If you look at this pleural critically, you see that it penetrates into the features of the lungs. So they help to also divide the lungs into the loops that they are made up of. So this is the visceral pleural as we've highlighted. Also to add that the visceral pleural tends to attach tightly to the surface of the lungs. You can hardly peel them off. They are like a structural component of the lung itself. So it is not easy to remove the visceral pleural from the lungs. So they are closely or tightly attached to it. The parietal pleural, we said that they line the interiors of the thoracic wall. Maybe during dissection, if you pull out the lungs and look at the thoracic cavity, you will see that interior walls of the thoracic cavity also appears to be glittery or slippery because of the lining of the parietal pleural. And this is the parietal pleural as we've also highlighted in previous slides. They also tend to be thicker than the visceral pleural. The parietal pleura is further subdivided into different units. We said that they line over the interior wall of the thoracic cavity, and they tend to be divided based on the region where they are lining. So let's look through this. First, we already know that this is the parietal pleura highlighted in red. So the various divisions that will be highlighting of the parietal pleura will be limited to the areas that is painted in red. So let's follow through. We have it divided this way. We have another division downwards. We have another division laterally. So let's go through the subdivision. The cervical pleural can also be referred to as the cupola pleural. This pleural tends to extend above the superior aperture of the thorax. This is the superior aperture of, of the thorax. This is like the beginning of the thorax. This is where it begins from. And the region that extends above it is called the cervical pleural because it's definitely going to be extending towards the cervical region. So any part of the parietal pleura that extends above the superior thoracic aperture is the cervical pleura. And this region is the cervical pleura. Then the next region is the coastal pleura. From the name coastal, it means ribs. It means the region that lines over the ribs and also the intercostal spaces. We know that between each of the ribs, we have intercostal space. So the region of the parietal pleura that lines over the ribs and the intercostal spaces is called the coastal pleura, lining from this region downwards to this limit. Then we have the next, the mediastinal pleura. From the name mediastina, it means the line, the lateral wall of the mediastinum. We already said in our lecture on the lungs, where we said that the heart is located between the two lungs. And the space where the heart is located is called the mediastinum. So the part of the parietal pleura that lines the lateral wall 
of the mediastinum is called the mediastinal pleura. So from this region, extending down to this region is the mediastinal pleura. This is where the mediastinum is, and this is the lateral part of the mediastinum. So it is the part of the parietal pleura that lines the lateral wall of the mediastinum. So that is the way it plays. Then the last region is diaphragmatic pleura. From the name, it means the region of the parietal pleura that is related to the diaphragm. And we know that the diaphragm partitions the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So it tends to create like a pad that separates the thorax from the abdomen. So the region of the parietal pleural that lines over the diaphragm is called the diaphragmatic pleura. And from this region to this region is the diaphragmatic pleura. So that is how they are being subdivided based on the regions within the thoracic cavity that the parietal pleura lines. And we should also note the differences in surface area. If we look at it, we say that the coastal plural takes the largest in terms of space. We say that the coastal plural takes the largest of the space where the parietal plural lines. Because the coastal plural lines this region, it is rounded kind of because the ribs extend from the posterior part that is extending from the vertebral column down to be attached on the sternum. This is like a rounded presentation, but may not be seen in this image because it is a 2D image. This would take like the largest in terms of surface area of the subdivision of the parietal pleura. It's also important for us to note that the visceral pleura, which is highlighted in blue, you can see it running through the entire surface of the lungs and the parietal pleura lining the internal wall of the thoracic cavity. As these membranes tend to run in their own different parts, you see that there's a region where they do not completely line the region where the part. And this is around the root of the lungs. And this is the root of the lungs. If you look at the visceral pleura, you see that it does not extend around this region. It tends to like create a space where the root of the lungs can emerge. And we already said that the root of the lungs are a collection of structures that tends to enter into the lungs and also exit it. So at this point, there is a deficit. The visceral pleura does not extend over it because it needs to create opening for the structures entering and exiting the lungs to pass through. And if you also look at the parietal pleura, it's also incomplete at that region. As a matter of fact, at the root of the lungs, the visceral pleura become continuous with the parietal pleura. It's just in a way to create space for the structures that form the root of the lungs to pass through. Well, it is good for us to note this point because a structure will definitely be emerging from this incomplete lining around the root of the lungs. How does the preliminary ligament emerge around the root of the lungs? We said that the visceral pleural is incomplete around the root region. So it tends to be continuous with the parietal pleural. At this region, there is a fold of ligaments that emerge and that is called the preliminary ligament. And as this ligament emerges, it runs downwards towards the diaphragm. We already said the diaphragm is at the lower border, which tends to like help to hold structures in the thorax and also help to separate the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. And we've talked about the functions of this ligament in our lecture in the lungs because it helps to hold the root of the lungs and running down towards the diaphragm, attaching to it, it's going to like help to hold the lungs in place and prevent it from folding or being twisted because we know that the lungs is a soft tissue because this will affect the function of the lungs. And also this preliminary ligament during inspiration, we know that the diaphragm tends to be depressed and the depression is to create more space for the thoracic cavity so that hair can enter into it. When the diaphragm is depressed, because the preliminary ligament is holding on to it, it's going to further depress with it. And the root of the lungs also is attached to this region. This will also follow in the part of depression, thereby pulling all the structure down. And when it pulls the structure down, more space will be created on top of this region so that the lungs can have the space to expand. And when the lungs expand, there's going to be free flow of hair into it for oxygenation to take place. During exercise, the preliminary vein, which carries oxygenated blood to body cell, there will be the need for increase in the supply of oxygenated blood to body tissue. And what the preliminary ligament does is 
when it is pulled down, the root of the lungs will have more space and there's going to be expansion created for the preliminary vein because the preliminary vein forms part of the structures taken as the root of the lung. This will create expansion in this region to carry more oxygenated blood out of the lungs to supply the body tissue during exercise or maybe during any intense activity. And this is the preliminary ligament highlighted in black. So what is now the pleural cavity? We talked about the visceral pleural which attaches directly on the surface of the lungs and the parietal pleural, which helps to line the interiors of the thoracic cavity. So the pleural cavity will then be a space between the visceral pleural and the parietal pleural. So a potential space that is created between this region and this region is this space, and this space is called the pleural cavity. This is the pleural cavity. This space is not empty. It is filled with the pleural fluid. And the pleural fluid is secreted by the parietal pleural. So it is the pleural membrane that secretes the fluid that is seen within the pleural cavity. This pleural fluid is secreted at the range of eight to 10 mils, not so much of a fluid. That is about two teaspoons. What is the function of the fluid that is seen within the pleural cavity? And that is the pleural fluid. The pleural fluid tends to allow easy movement between the lungs and the thoracic wall. So it tends to prevent or reduce friction between the lungs and the thoracic wall. Also, this fluid tends to produce surface tension between the visceral pleura that lines the lungs and the parietal pleura that lines the interior wall of the thoracic cavity. So when there is expansion within the thoracic wall, because of the surface tension that is created between the two layers, this is the visceral pleura that lines the lungs, and this is the parietal pleura. Because of the creation of surface tension that the fluid presents, when there is expansion in the thoracic cavities, this will be further taken closer to it, thereby creating an expansion for the lungs for head to brush into. Then we have pleural recess. The recess are potential spaces that is created by the parietal pleura. These spaces are also very important. Potential spaces that are created within the pleural cavity. And these spaces are formed by the parietal pleura. This is the parietal pleura highlighted in red. And this pleura tends to create spaces within the pleural cavity. So let's look at the different pleural recesses that we have within the pleural cavity. The costal mediastinal recess is a potential space that is formed at a point where the costal part of the parietal pleural connects with the mediastinal part of the parietal pleural. We have the costal part of the parietal pleural lining through the costal surface. And at this point, they tend to meet with the mediastinal region of the parietal pleural. And it is at this point that they create this potential space. And this space is called the costal mediastinal recess. And this is the costal mediastinal recess. We also have another recess that is called the costal diaphragmatic recess. This recess, we should by now know that is a recess that is created when the costal pleura becomes continuous with the diaphragmatic pleura. So this is the region where we have the costal region of the parietal pleura being continuous with the diaphragmatic part of the parietal pleura. And this is the space created around that region. So these are potential spaces that are created by the parietal pleura. They help to create space for expansion of the lungs. We've been talking about lungs expanding due to the increase in the thoracic cavity. The space where the lungs will expand into are those recesses. And one of them is the costal mediastinal recess, and the other one is the costal diaphragmatic recess. So the blood supply of the pleural membrane. First, the visceral pleural. The visceral pleural, we say, is closely attached to the lungs. So it also enjoys the blood supply of the lungs, which is the bronchial artery. We already said that the lungs has its own blood supply that gives oxygen and nutrients to itself, and that is the bronchial artery. The bronchial artery emerges from the thoracic aorta. We have the hack of aorta around this region, within the manubrum and the body of the sternum, which is the sternal angle of Louis. That's where we have the hack of aorta. And descending from the heart is the descending aorta. The initial segment of the descending aorta is the thoracic aorta, followed down by the abdominal aorta. So from the thoracic aorta, we have the emergence of the bronchial artery that supplies the tissue of the lungs with oxygen and nutrients. And this also supplies the visceral pleural of the lungs with oxygen and nutrients because they are closely attached to the lungs. So they also enjoy the blood supply of the lungs.
Then for the parietal pleural, the parietal pleural, we know that they line the interiors of the thoracic wall. Their blood supply is from branches from a number of vessels. This is the thoracic aorta, which is the initial segment of the descending aorta. So from the thoracic aorta, we have the intercostal arteries. Branches from this artery supplies the parietal pleural around that region. Then we have the internal thoracic artery. The internal thoracic artery branches from the subclavian artery. This is the sub Clavian, and we know that the subclavian artery is a branch from the heart of aorta, which is around this space. So from the subclavian, we have the internal thoracic artery that runs along the lateral border of the sternum. This is the sternum, the chest bone. You can see it's running down and branches from the internal thoracic artery also emerge to supply the parietal pleural around the thoracic region. Then running more distally, there's a final bifurcation of the internal thoracic artery into the musculophrenic artery and the superior epigastric artery. The musculophrenic artery also gives branch to supply interior walls of the thoracic cavity around that region. So that is how we have the blood supply of the pyretal pleural coming from branches from these three arteries. The innervation of the pleural. For the pyretal pleural, the pyretal pleural is innervated by the phrenic nerve and the intercostal nerves. The pyretal pleural is sensitive to pain, pressure, and temperature. For the visceral pleural, it is insensitive to pain, pressure, and temperature because it is not innervated by nerves that carries this stimuli. What they are sensitive to is stretch, just stretch stimuli. They are innervated by the pulmonary plexus. The pulmonary plexus is seen around the root of the lungs. And this is formed by the sympathetic chain and the vagus nerve, which carries sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. We've discussed this in our lecture in the lungs. So it means that the visceral pleural also enjoys the innervation of the lungs. As we see in the blood supply, we see that the blood supply of the lungs is what also supplies the visceral pleural. So also the innervation because they are closely adherent to the surface of the lungs. Clinical anatomy, we have pleural effusion. Pleural effusion is also referred to as water on the lungs. This is the accumulation of fluid in the pleural cavity. We said that the space between the visceral pleural and the parietal pleural is the pleural cavity. And this space is filled with pleural fluid. This pleural fluid is synthesized or produced by the parietal pleural. When there is over secretion of the pleural fluid by the pleural membrane, there is going to be accumulation of this fluid within the pleural cavity and this is called pleural effusion and this occur when you have irritation of the pleural membrane which is also referred to pleuritis when there's inflammation is going to lead to an increase in the secretion of the pleural fluid also when the membrane is irritated or infected we already said that the pleural fluid is within eight to ten mils and when it is secreted more than that there's going to be accumulation of the fluid within this space. And symptoms include coughing. There could be chest pain or shortness of breath. Major treatment option is the use of antibiotics or water pills, or a surgical procedure may be used to drain the fluid out of this space. Then we have pneumothorax. Pneumothorax occur when hair leaks into the pleural cavity. We already said that the pleural cavity is located between the visceral pleural and the parietal pleural. And what is contained within the pleural cavity is the pleural fluid and not hair. So when hair is seen within this space, it's going to put pressure on the lungs and it's going to cause the collapse of the lungs. Hair is not supposed to be seen within this region. The only place where hair is supposed to be seen is within the lungs so that the pressure will be pushed outward for expansion to take place. But when you have hair within this space, it's going to put the pressure onto the lungs and this will cause the lungs to collapse. The symptoms that we see in this kind of situation could include shortness of breath. There could be chest pain, cough, and also hypoxia, which is a reduction in oxygen supply to body cell. Treatment option is draining the hair out through the use of a chest tooth. Thanks for spending your time watching. Let's meet again.